Hello again, everybody. Peter Maravellis here on behalf of City Lights Booksellers and Publishers, the City Lights Foundation, and our partners at PM Press. I'd like to welcome you to session one of Dangerous Visions and New Worlds. This session is called Imagining New Worlds, What Activists Can and Have Learned from Sci-Fi. It's going to be moderated by Ian McIntyre and is going to feature Annalie Newitz and Shelley Streeby. A few words about our participants. Ian McIntyre is a Melbourne-based author, musician, and community radio broadcaster who has written a variety of books on activism, history, and music. Together with Andrew Nede, he is the co-editor of Dangerous Visions and New Worlds, Radical Science Fiction, 1950 through 1985. His previous publications include Sticking It to the Man, Revolution and Counterculture, and Pulp and Popular Fiction, On the Fly, Hobo Literature and Songs, and Girl Gangs, Biker Boys, and Real Cool Cats, amongst other titles. Annalie Newitz is a journalist, editor, and author of both fiction and nonfiction, who has written for the periodicals Popular Science and Wired. From 1999 to 2008, they wrote a syndicated weekly column called Textploitation. And from 2000 to 2004, they were the cultural editor at the San Francisco Bay Guardian. In 2004, they became a policy analyst at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And as of 2019, Annalie Newitz is a contributing opinion writer at the New York Times. They are the author of numerous books of fiction and nonfiction, their latest being Four Lost Cities, A Secret History of the Urban Age from W.W. Norton. So joining them will be Shelley Streeby. Shelley Streeby is Professor of Ethnic Studies and Literature at the University of California in San Diego. She is the author of American Sensations, Class, Empire, and the Production of Popular Culture, and a co-editor of Empire and the Literature of Sensation, an anthology of 19th century popular fiction. Her most recent book is Imagining the Future of Climate Change, World Making Through Science, Fiction, and Activism. Since 2010, she is the director of the Clarion Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers Workshop at UCSD. She is also on the internet board of the UCSD's Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. So before we begin, I would like to remind you we're going to be posting links with which you may purchase copies of Dangerous Visions and indeed books by our featured authors. So please welcome now Ian McIntyre to get things going. Thank you, and thanks to City Lights for uh, hosting this event. Uh, first up, I'd like to say I'm speaking from the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri peoples, and I'd like to acknowledge their elders past and present, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Now, Samuel Delaney famously argued, um, science fiction is not about the future. It uses the future as a narrative convention to present significant distortions of the past. Science fiction is about the current world, the given world shared by the writer and the reader. So this uh, inevitable refracting of the past uh, and the present and exploration of possibilities, both terrifying and liberating, is what I think provides speculative and science fiction with its radical potential and makes it a valuable tool and a source of succour and inspiration for those who are trying to bring forth a different present and future and challenge understandings of the past and present. Thanks to Anna Lee and Shelley for joining me today. So I'd like to start a discussion about how speculative and science fiction has been used to highlight injustices and exploitation and explore responses to them by asking you to both talk about some of the science fiction that you first came across, which changed the way <clears throat> you viewed the world around you. So maybe we'll start with Shelley. Thanks, Ian. I'm really glad to be here today. And I'm uh, speaking from Kumeya land. So I want to start with a land acknowledgement uh, there. Um, yeah, well, I guess you're thinking more about when we were younger, I suppose. And when I was a teen, I read everything I could get my hands on. So I ended up reading a lot of um, science fiction magazines that would find their way into uh, used stores where there were a bunch of, you know, piles of them on the floor. And I read a lot of Philip K. Dick short stories that really kind of blew my mind, I remember. But I really got into Ursula K. Le Guin, even as a, uh, I guess, a tween. Uh, I liked the Earthsea novels. 
Uh, when I began to start reading more serious science fiction, I really got into The Dispossessed. And I do remember finding a copy of Orbit, the science fiction journal, and seeing her tour de force short story, Direction of the Road, which is narrated from the point of view of a tree uh, back in 1973. And I was just really blown away by that story. Just, you know, that really changed the way I thought about the world and what uh, science fiction could do. And I was also an avid reader of her early novels, like The Word for World is Forest, the great anti-Vietnam War novel by Le Guin, which, you know, was part of the inspiration for Avatar but with no white guy savior and just the way that she talked about the forest and the way point of view kind of shifted from kind of the imperialist story to the kind of eco nature story was super fascinating to me but it was really Octavia Butler when I was in my 20s that made the big impact and uh, I remember her trilogy Dawn, Adulthood Rights, and Imago where humans survive a nuclear war by reproducing with aliens who have a whole different sex gender system. I was so amazed by her ability to imagine this different sex gender system that took five beings instead of two to reproduce. And it was also about surviving a nuclear war and criticizing dominant versions of white manhood and criticizing militarism and nuclear proliferation, all with a Black woman at the center that was kind of riffing off the Henrietta Lacks story about, you know, Black people being the subject of medical experiments. So that was really the big one for me. And then after that Parable of the Sower, Butler's 1993 novel, I'm sure we'll be talking about more today, but I first read it when I was in Los Angeles for the summer, the year after the Los Angeles uprisings, when Butler's novel came out. And I was just so amazed by how she was using the idea of the near present, kind of tell us where we were going. And one of the ways it told me we were going is the gated city is not the answer the gated community. That was the age of the gated community. We're just going to wall off social disaster. And she was saying that world is not sustainable. We have to find another way. So that was just really real to me back in 1993. And so I would have to say that was the single biggest thing in making me see how science fiction could change the world. Fantastic. And um, yeah, Anna Lee, what was some, uh, some things that initially sparked you off? Yeah. Um, so like Shelley, um, of course, I was super influenced by um, Ursula Le Guin. You know, as a kid, I was reading the Earthsea books, um, and uh, later in life, of course, Octavia Butler as well. Um, but I'll be honest, uh, when I was a kid, I was also reading, you know, science fiction um, in elementary school, and you know, kind of rediscovered it again when I was a tween. Um, and I think. One of the first books that really blew me away as a, as a little kid was this odd book by Andre Norton called Star Cat, where cat is spelled K-A-T, um, K -A apostrophe A-T. Um, and it's a middle grade book. Um, I'm not sure if it's still in print, but uh, it's about um, two kids who are uh, probably 10 or 11. Um, one is uh, a black girl who is kind of partly homeless. Um, and one of them is a, a white boy who also has like family problems and they discover that this cat that they have kind of that's sort of their pet is actually an alien from another planet um, that is suffering through a lot of problems and this cat has come to earth to kind of um, scout things out and there's a couple of other cats like them there's cats and then there's cats and the book really um, it blew me away for a couple of reasons. One was that um, I grew up in a middle class suburb and I had never been exposed to the idea that like there might be kids my age who were homeless. Um, I mean, I knew about homelessness, but it was very distant and remote to me. And the fact that this kid was a hero and she's the one who kind of figures out um, that there's nothing left on earth for her and her friend and that they should go away with the cats, which they do. And then there's a sequel where they're on star cat planet, whatever. Um, but my point is that it was a point of view I'd never experienced. I empathized really strongly with them. And I also really, um, loved the idea of, uh, reframing what it means to be a person and what it means to have intelligence, because these are cats that no one except these two little kids have noticed are actually smarter than people, you know, and because there's all these humans running around with their biases about who gets to be, you know, a person and who gets to, to be treated, um, as, as a, an equal party in, um, in civilization, I guess. Uh, you know, suddenly um, I had this view of um, 
the animal world, uh, which includes humans, that was really different. And so um, I loved that. And I've, I've carried that into my adulthood with me. I just finished writing a novel that's coming out next year that has a lot of non-human animal characters. And I know that Star Cat was in my head somewhere. Um, the other book that really influenced me um, when I was a kid, uh, I had spent a while not reading science fiction and then I got back into it thanks to a really nice librarian at my local library in Orange County where I grew up. Um, and she recommended that I read um, The Martian Chronicles by Ray Bradbury. And it was a grown up book. Um, and I was about 12 and I was like, woo, you know, grown up book. Uh, and the thing that ripped my brain apart uh, when I read it was that, um, you know, so Martian Chronicles uh, is Ray Bradbury's collection of short stories about colonizing Mars. It's about several waves of Earth colonization. Um, and he explicitly intended it to be commentary on white settler colonialism in the United States. Um, that was uh, very much his intention. And the stories are very weird and surreal in some cases, very contradictory. So, and they're told at different points in the colonization, because like I said, there's different waves of colonization and there's different kinds of Martians. And my little brain at the time was like, okay, you know, I'd experienced things like Star Trek. And I was like, the way it works is that there's a bunch of people that are humans and all the humans are the same. And they go to the planet Mars and all the Martians are the same. And it's like humans versus Martians. But in the Martian Chronicles, that's not at all how it is. It's a planet that is incredibly diverse. It has its own history. Um, and, and characters who come in from Earth have very different motivations. And there are um, environmental disasters that are happening, political disasters. Um, the Martians are, of course, um, being killed off uh, in droves. And um, it just, it really disturbed me. And it really, um, it brought to mind the fact that, um, you know, these kinds of science fiction tropes of like, you know, colonizing another world or invading another world um, really can be quite ambiguous. And I think it was my first exposure to the notion that colonization is an ambiguous process and it involves not just violence, but appropriation and um, that there's ways of subjugating people that don't involve guns. Um, certainly it does involve guns, but it also involves, um, you know, ideology and it involves, um, you know, psychological brutality. And uh, it um, really, again, stuck with me, this idea that, um, you know, there's not just one story in colonialism, that there are many, many stories that come together. And um, I have not reread Martian Chronicles as an adult. I'm a little afraid to, I'm not sure I would um, experience it the same way, but certainly at the time um, it was very important to me. Um, and then once I became an adult, of course, uh, I was reading a, a wide range of science fiction, including as I, as I said um, earlier, Octavia Butler was incredibly influential. Um, I also read um, a lot of Ken McLeod when I first got back into science fiction, who's a, a Scottish uh, lefty writer, um, socialist writer, uh, who um, is always interested in revolutionary politics on other worlds. And so um, that kind of brought me back into science fiction was reading these like actually a lot of angry Scottish men <laughs> yeah. writing about politics. Um, uh, Ian and Banks would be another one. So yeah, that was that's kind of where I came out of it. Right. And uh, yeah, special thanks to all those librarians and uh, used bookstore people who made this stuff available um, back in the in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s to uh, to people who didn't have much money uh, wouldn't have been able to uh, have found them otherwise. Um, certainly my local library turned me on to a uh, whole range of, of, of fantastic things, even though we were out in the burbs and it didn't seem like many people were interested in it. There were books on punk and books on anarchism and uh, books by Ursula Le Guin and Joanna Russ and many others. All right, well, science fiction's often been associated with the future, but alternate, alternate histories, time travel and works that blur or don't distinguish between past, present and future are a key part of the field. And these can help us to better wrestle with the past and its weight on the present. 
Um, such works also help us, like other forms of historical fiction, to gain a better sense of how people in earlier periods understood their times and how their visions of the future were shaped by them. Um, Shelley, in your book, Imagining the Future of Climate Change, World Making Through Science Fiction and Activism, you discuss concepts concerning the nature of time and their connections to social change. Could you specifically talk about the approaches and worldviews of histo histofuturism and native slipstream within SF? Yes, I'd be happy to. Well, histofuturism, that's a big word, I'd like to say, is actually Octavia E. Butler's invention. She says she is the one who invented it and coined it. And I found her theorizing it in one of the hundreds of wire-bound notebooks that she kept through much of her life. She left hundreds of boxes of her papers and other materials to the Huntington Library in San Marino, California when she died. And in one of these notebooks, she starts talking about what it would mean to be a histofuturist as opposed to an historian or a futurist. So she says the futurists around her who are like predicting technological change, she said all they care about is technology. They often leave the people out. She said, on the other hand, she was kind of drawn to the work of the historian and even thought about being one. But she said dominant versions of history, you know, often kind of privilege uh, white people and the colonialism story. And they sometimes malign whole races and peoples, she wrote. So she said she was going to combine the two, be a histo-futurist, which meant for her extrapolating from the historical and technological past and present to imagine a future. And we see this doing her, that we see her doing this a lot, you know, in her writing, I think. Um, she's uh, questioning the white Western progress narrative in a lot of ways. She's putting pressure on the present instead of just naturalizing it or taking it for granted. You know, she's asking, how are we in the present going to shape change in the future? And you know, her papers show Butler did a massive amount of research for her books. She's always playing with time. There's the time travel novel Kindred where she goes back to 19th century slavery times in Maryland and her uh, black and white ancestors of the past and Wild Seed where dueling immortals traverse continents and time to uh, have dueling kind of ideas about what the future like is like and what community should be like. And Parable of the Sower, which works with the near future, which is a coming of age story, trying to imagine how are we going to kind of deal with those problems. So I think histofuturism is a really a way of like connecting these different times for Butler. And we can also see a lot of other writers doing this, but Native Slipstream is more specific that is uh, Anishinaabe scholar Grace Dillon's theorization and her indispensable anthology, Walking the Clouds, an anthology of indigenous science fiction is where I take the term native slipstream. And she defines it as a kind of speculative fiction within science fiction uh, that infuses stories with time travel, alternate realities and multiverses and alternative histories. But she says native slipstream specifically views time as past, present, and future, and it's flowing together like currents in a stream. And she points out that the Chippewa writer Gerald Visner actually used the term slipstream in 1978, which was 11 years before Bruce Sterling used it in the fanzine I. And Visner wrote a story called Custer on the Slipstream, which looks at Custer as kind of the poster child of US militarism directed against native people and connects that to different times. And so I think that for Visner and for Dylan, insisting on the long histories of colonialism and resistance and the connections among different flashpoints in time is really key. Uh, Visner was writing Bearheart novels, two different ones in uh, the 70s and 1980. And he was extrapolating from the 1970s oil crisis, imagining a future world in the last days of the fossil fuel economy. And the US government invades reservations to extract more resources. So, you know, Visner is responding to a long history of resource extraction, but he's anticipating the world we live in now and also mixing up different times to kind of make those connections. So I think all of these things, both um, the native slipstream and Butler's histofuturism, they're messing with linear time, the linear time that's really crucial to the white Western progress narrative, where we move forward and we grow and we have this history of capitalist growth that will lead us to a better place and technology will always be good and we can always externalize costs. And I think all of this stuff that I've been looking at uh, through Dylan, through Butler, through other writers of color and indigenous writers, it's really putting a lot of pressure on that linear uh, time that is so key to 
uh, white Western colonialism and that narrative of progress. Right. Um, Anna Lee, uh, as the title of the book would suggest, time travel is very much at the centre of your novel, The Future of Another Timeline. Now, the book has this sort of war between a group of misogynistic reactionaries and uh, versus the, the feminist daughters of Harriet. And it not only drops the reader into different points in time, so, you know, they get to experience some flavour of that time, but also explores the nature of social change more broadly. So, I guess two part question. Firstly, what inspired you to write a time travel novel? And secondly, could you comment on how <clears throat> the book grapples with the role of individual and collective activism and social forces in shaping the future and how we understand the past? Yeah, I mean, you know, I did not intend to write a time travel novel originally. Um, I had been very leery of it. I mean, they're a huge pain in the ass to write because there's a lot of, um, you know, plotting and um, there's a lot of like, where are they now? How did they get their weight? If they did this, is it a paradox? And um, I'm actually, I, I love character driven stories and I love world building, but like plotting is always a thing that I find challenging. So um, I had an initially intended to write a um, an alternate history. Uh, where abortion was not illegal, was where abortion was illegal in the United States. And I was thinking, you know, what would happen if that were the case? Um, and it seemed obvious to me that, um, you know, people like me would just start murdering people, mur murdering men specifically, um, which, you know, it just, that was just sort of, I was spitballing, you know? Um, and I was like, okay, first of all, that's kind of extreme. And also, how did we get to that alternate history like wh what kind of kicked us over um what was the precipitating moment of div you know divergence um and i was like well you know it kind of it, it's it's so kind of surreal in a lot of ways that i want not that abortion would be illegal as surreal but like a lot of other elements of the story i wanted to tell such as random teenagers becoming like mass murderers um so I decided I would do time travel as the mechanism for this alternate history. And I was very inspired by uh, a whole history of feminist time travel stories. I mean, Shelley has been talking about a few of them. Um, Octavia Butler's story, Kindred, which is one of my favorites because um, it's all about how uh, time travel is never simple. You know, you go back and you think you're saving your ancestor and it turns out that your ancestor is this horrible plantation owner, white guy who's uh, you know, forcing his um, slaves to have sex with him or, or kind of um, passive aggressively getting them to. And, um, and I love that. I was really influenced by um, uh, The Female Man by Joanna Russ, which is just one of my favorite novels of all time. It's also a great satire of academia and what it's like to be a woman in academia. Um, and that's a novel about uh, one woman who kind of exists in three different timelines almost and how they overlap and um one of whom is a professor who has to deal with like annoying dudes at, at her university um i also really love um woman on the edge of time margie piercy's novel which i think now might i think now it may not hold up it's a bit cheesy um and it has some dubious race politics in it um it was written in the 70s uh but what it does have that I really love is, um, again, this idea that um, there's a, a kind of a future that um, is in question and in flux, and the way that we um, make sure that this terrible possible future doesn't happen is through solidarity with, um, with other progressives up and down the timeline, basically. Um, and it also has a really interesting view of a kind of eco-feminist future um, where men get pregnant and it's all very nice, you know, men are breastfeeding and it's, it's lovely. Um, always love an impreg story. Um, and so those were some of my influences. Um, and, you know, the, what I will say about future of another timeline is that, um, once I had decided that it was going to be time travel, um, that allowed me to kind of get away from thinking about this kind of um, revenge narrative of like, okay, they've taken away abortion. Now there's going to be teenage girls murdering guys. There is that in the story, um, but it is mostly focused on um, this group of time traveling feminists who realize that if they want to 
do political activism to make abortion legal, that they have to keep going back further in time. And a lot of their belief uh, system in, among the, these feminists is that uh, history is transformed through collective action. So you can't just like go back in time and kill Hitler. Uh, you'd have to go back in time and persuade the German people that fascism is bad, uh, which is very, very hard to do. Um, and you might not be able to do that uh, as, as, as fascism is rising. You might have to go back um, 100 years previous. Um, and so in their case, they're trying to change the laws in the 1990s and then also in the 2020s. And so they go back to the 1890s um, to fight Anthony Comstock. Um, but they can't fight him directly. They, again, they can't murder Anthony Comstock. So they have to come up with creative ways to protest his um, anti-abortion politics, his anti-erotic uh, politics. Um, and he, uh, so they have to, they organize these um, sort of dance protests with a bunch of the uh, belly dancers from the Chicago World's Fair. Uh, and so, and they also have to go back further in time too. And they eventually wind up in like the Ordovician period, which is about, uh, you know, 450 million years ago uh, when there was a supercontinent and, you know, there was no life on land. And there's actually a good reason why they wind up there. And that's, I guess, kind of a spoiler for a book that's been out for many years. But um, it turns out that it's very, very hard to change the timeline. Uh, from just one position in time. And so I think that this goes into the slipstream idea that Shelley was talking about, which is um, that, you know, uh, this notion that time progresses in some kind of rational way, um, and that we just keep getting better and better, and like, everyone gets richer and more, more free, <laughs> whatever the fuck that would mean, um, you know, that, uh, that in fact, things are always twisting around and like, uh, time, there's always these um, residual political formations crashing up against uh, new kinds of for political alliances and that all of this stuff is um, mediated by where you live on the globe. Um, and so um, I really, I wanted to capture that messiness and at the same time, capture how much um, there is, how much as we try to progress politically, as we try to have more um, you know, autonomy for uh, subjugated groups, that the way we do that is by imaginatively connecting with our ancestors and with future generations. And that that's, that part of our solidarity has to extend beyond our own time because otherwise there's no hope because, you know, there's so much to, in the present moment, um, it's so easy to get sucked into nihilism and dystopian thinking. Uh, and it's only when you can kind of pull yourself up a little bit and see a broader stream that you start to see, actually, yeah, we are making a difference, even though it feels dark and, um, and things are so brutal right now. Um, you know, our, our ancestors are smiling at us because like, like my great grandmother couldn't vote. You know, and I bet she's like, you know, I bet she would think it was pretty badass that, you know, I get to vote and I get to sit here and talk to you about books. And so, you know, even though uh, things are terrible, like there is that sense of connection. And so um, that's really, again, that's kind of what the novel is about, is about how time travel allows you to literalize that, that connection and see how political action keeps rolling through the timeline and keeps coming back. Um, even when, um, you know, so much of, of our world is, you know, going, uh, <laughs> going in directions we do not like. <laughs> well, following on from that discussion, um, could you both comment on science fiction's ability to serve as a testing ground and an imaginary for thinking about organisation, strategy, tactics, the means of change in the way that we resist and overcome oppression and problems in the present. And um, yeah, maybe we'll start with Shelley. Yeah, as Annalie was talking uh, about the ancestors, I was thinking about my favorite example of kind of science fiction as a testing ground for 
thinking about change would be the anthology Octavia's Rude, Science Fiction Stories from Social Justice Movements, which was edited by Adrienne Marie Brown and Walida Imarisha and uh, came out in 2015. And I teach it constantly. But in the intro, I remember Imarisha saying, like, if you think about uh, their ancestors uh, and what they went through, that they are like, it's science fiction, that they're alive and walking around today. And that really resonated with me when uh, Walida or, or when uh, Emily was talking. But I think Walita's introduction to Octavia's Brood is just really brilliant. And she says all organizing is science fiction at one point in that intro, and that organizers and activists dedicate their lives to creating and envisioning another world or many other worlds. And I just love the way that uh, Brown and Imarisha are doing that in Octavia's Brood because they went through this collective process where they were working with uh, many social justice organizers, many artists of different sorts, and trying to pull out the kind of interesting uh, kind of emancipatory narratives out of their story and kind of connect them to world building projects in the present. And I really love the way they do that. I love their ideas about visionary fiction and how you know we can distinguish uh, science fiction that has relevance toward building newer, freer worlds from a more mainstream tradition, which too often reinforces dominant narratives of power. So I think the way they did this collectively in their book as a project is really cool. Cool. And I love the way it's kind of spilled over into all kinds of other organizing projects for many of them. So Adrienne Marie Brown is one of my favorite books of the last 20 years, Emergent Strategy, uh, Shaping Worlds, Shaping Change, um, and it's AK Press, but it's just a beautiful book. And she is really inspired by Octavia Butler's writing to think about models of Black feminist leadership. And she has participated in and led uh, workshops that do collective ideation, where communities talk about kind of the problems they're facing and what kind of answers they might be able to come up with and actually create stories, science fiction stories around those problems and possibilities. So for me, that's the most concrete example I can think of. I mean, I love the way that, uh, that they return to uh, Octavia to think about shaping change. And a lot of what Octavia had to say about shaping change has inspired social movement activists today. Like, you know, the phrase, all you touch, you change, all you, all you change changes you. The only lasting truth is change. And I think that's a really different idea than we get in a lot of contemporary thought. Butler's idea that people change the world by touching and interacting with it and people are in turn transformed by the world. That's just so different from the ideal of isolated individuals developing by separating from and rising above others and heroically mastering the world. That's become a kind of neoliberal common sense in mainstream culture since Butler's time. So I feel like all of these people who are collectively doing projects about shaping change kind of inspired by Butler. That's some of the coolest stuff I know in that regard. But, you know, we could look backwards in time too. I'm really interested in Judith Merrill, uh, who was writing short stories and novels in the 40s and 50s, and then a little bit into the 60s, and then helped to introduce like the British New Wave to the United States and edited a whole bunch of best of the year anthologies. But she stopped writing science fiction at one point and started doing all kinds of other projects. And she said they were all examples of speculative thinking and how science fiction was spilling over into other areas like media and politics and that you didn't have to write science fiction stories now to do kind of science fiction thinking. And so she was trying to do them when she was doing a little prefaces to the Doctor Who TV shows on you know, TV Ontario back in the day. And she was doing all kinds of documentaries that she put together. She was going to Japan and co-leading uh, projects to translate Japanese and Korean science fiction, often those that were about US militarism or the bomb or you know, ecological damage. So I'm super interested in Merrill and how she was thinking about speculative thinking. Um, also, I'd have to turn to Le Guin. Uh, I really love a lot of her writing about how science fiction can be like thought experiments that help us confront the future. And I especially love her essay, The Carrier Bag Theory of Fiction, where she says we should think about stories as technologies that aren't weapons that force energy outward, but baskets that bring energy home. So some of those uh, kind of strains of thought would be super important to me in thinking about your question. Great. And um, yeah, Annalee, um, I guess, thoughts about works and science fiction's ability in general to sort of help us think about how we go about changing things and, and what tactics and strategies we use. Yeah, no, I'm super glad that um, Shelley mentioned um, uh, Judith Merrill, who's super awesome and I feel like is only now being truly appreciated 
Um, and I also wanted to pick up on um, what you were saying about um, Adrienne Marie Brown, who is such a great example of someone who is directly taking inspiration from science fiction and trying to put it into um, practice. And she's um, popularized this idea of pleasure activism, um, which I think uh, has been around for a long time, but she's been, uh, Brown has been really um, good about foregrounding it. And um, I think that uh, when we think about the role of science fiction and also fantasy um, in inspiring us, um, one of the things that we often neglect is the fact that um, a lot of a lot of this kind of fiction is escapist, uh, and it is designed to provide us with pleasure. It's a form of pleasure activism, not because it is writing directly about that, but because it is offering us um, a way to ease our pain um, in a world that is uh, often so cruel to many of us. And um, one of the, there's a couple examples of this that are quite recent um, that struck me as fitting into the theme here. Um, I'm actually just uh, finishing up reading um, a new novel um, by Isaac Fellman, which is called Dead Collections, which is uh, set in San Francisco, uh, where I am right now. And uh, it is about a vampire, a trans man vampire archivist. Um, and it's dealing with um, a lot of intersectional questions um, around, um, you know, first of all, just being a trans guy and all of the bullshit he has to deal because of that, with, with because of that, but also vampirism. Um, his conception of vampirism is very much like um, having a chronic invisible disability uh, because he can't go out uh, during the day. He can't be exposed to sunlight um, and he has to get blood transfusions, you know, once a week. So he's often in the hospital. And also it's very difficult for him to go to work because he has to get to work before it's light and then leave after it's dark. And so there's all these microaggressions from his colleagues about like, you know, whether he's crashing in the office and like, why does he stay so late and come so early? And, um, but at the same time, this is a book that's a romance. He meets this amazing person uh, who is as geeky as, as he is about archives and um, is really into uh, fanfic the way he is. And they bond, they have super hot sex. They have like this beautiful relationship in the middle of this giant mess, which is, life in San Francisco uh, in the contemporary time that we're in where everything is really expensive. Lots of people are threatened with homelessness. Um, and, you know, we're living through nationally a huge backlash against people who are trans. Um, and so I feel like that story of a beautiful romance in the rubble, in the dead collections, literally, um, of, our, of our history, um, provides a kind of model for resistance. Um, because I, I always think that romance and friendship are like the smallest unit of resistance to uh, systemic um, oppression. Um, another great example of this that I'll mention is um, the Canadian writer C.L. Polk, um, who has this really fantastic trilogy, um, which starts with a novel called Witchmark. Um, and it is, it's urban fantasy, and it's um, dealing with um, war, it's kind of set in a secondary world that's just experienced something like World War I. Uh, but they're also dealing with um, in, an energy crisis that's connected to magic. Um, and there's a lot of um, environmental exploitation and um, exploitation of human labor around this kind of magical uh, energy crisis. Um, and also there's been these horrible war crimes that kind of lurk in the background. But at the same time, there is a wonderful queer romance happening and resistance is tied to that romance. And the characters who are falling in love are making connections that are ultimately uh, in the grand arc of the trilogy going to allow them to kind of overthrow this corrupt uh, monarchic regime. And um, it's just awesome. Like it's, you know, you're reading it and it's crack fic, but it's also revolutionary. And it's also, like I said, a model of queer love uh, in the midst of this terrible world. Um, so I think that that's one model and I'm, I'm calling that the kind of pleasure resistance model of fiction as 
balm and fiction as um, a way to escape and reassure ourselves that things don't have to be like this. You know, they can be better. There is love out there still and hope. Um, and then the other thing I want to uh, mention briefly, which I think is a more straightforward way of thinking about how science fiction can inspire activism. Um, I've been thinking a lot lately about how 1980s and early 90s cyberpunk really influenced um, uh, underground digital media and now what we would call um, sort of social media activism. Uh, where people are, you know, going into like war zones and posting stuff um, from there, um, you know, on whatever social media network that they're using, um, or they're using Signal to like get the information out to journalists. Um, and, you know, there's a whole set of things that are happening in that area. There's things like culture jamming and media jamming, there's, which are kind of popular in the 90s, and then there's the citizen journalism. Um, and a lot of that is inspired, I think, by, um, you know, everything from watching Max Headroom to uh, reading, you know, early, like, Neuromancer, uh, William Gibson's early novel, um, reading, you um, kind of early Neil Stevenson novels where you have characters that are like encrusted with surveillance devices that they're using to report on um, uh, political activities. And so um, that's, I think, uh, an ongoing um, kind of conversation that science fiction is having with, uh, with journalism right now, that uh, we're still seeing uh, a strong strand of cyberpunk uh, in our science fiction. A lot of it does have to do with media. Um, even something like Hunger Games um, is, it's interesting because it's a very media savvy story about a revolution that is, um, that is appropriated by the mainstream media and that is kind of hollowed out by the media. So it's, it's a genuine revolution that then becomes kind of political spectacle uh, and kind of just doesn't really ultimately change very much. Um, and so I think that part of what um, activists have learned from cyberpunk is the ways in which, uh, you know, media can be used to get a radical message out, but also how media can be used to undermine and commodify that message and turn it into something that is safe and not threatening uh, to, to the status quo. So um, I love all of that. I'm excited that that is still going on and that we're still learning more about um, how to use social media for good. Um, little disappointed about the whole fascism and social media thing, uh, but I think that's why this is going to continue to be an ongoing preoccupation of science fiction because we're still trying to figure out what the hell we're doing. Fantastic. Thanks for those thoughts from both of you. Um, so we're in the midst of a worsening climate catastrophe and writers have long used speculative and science fiction to explore the consequences of the abuse of nature. Um, Shelley, could you discuss perhaps in relation to a few key authors, how some of the earliest science fiction did this and how the themes and issues uh, that were explored changed uh, and didn't, you know, from the 50s to the 1980s? Sure. Um, well, you know, if we look way backwards in time, some of the earliest science fiction on the abuse of nature and climate change would be, you know, something like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, where she was already criticizing the idea that humans can control nature without risks or costs and showing how that's often a white European masculine fantasy and tied to settler colonialism and imperialism. But in the late 19th century, you start to see a certain amount of science fiction dealing with natural disasters and comets and other kinds of forces where they change the climate or the weather, but they almost never attribute those kinds of changes to human activity. Uh, one exception was Jules Verne's The Purchase of the North Pole in 1889. And, you know, Verne is often telling stories of wonderful inventions, but in this novel, he's kind of making fun of Americans because um, what you have in the novel is you have these avaricious Americans who they want to change the Earth's axis so they can access coal reserves at the North Pole. And he's trying to make fun of, you know, uh, sort of U.S. people wanting to make money no matter what the cost. But in the end, he just kind of reassures his readers that God wouldn't really allow, you know, anything like that to happen. <laughs> so he kind of gives it to us and takes it, it away. But we do start to see, like, from the 50s through the 80s, a lot of uh, science fiction kind of thinking about uh, the problem of ecological um, destruction, often linking it to militarism in the 1950s. So there, you know, the issues of nuclear war and nuclear proliferation and the 
bomb. Those were really shaping a lot of the um, thinking about from science fiction about climate and environment. So again, Judith Merrill, she connected science fiction to activism and was criticizing a golden age kind of faith in progress and editor John Campbell's idealization of like US technology and militarism in uh, you know the journals he was editing. So she wrote a story called That Only a Mother in 1948. And it's about a young mother's inability to see that she has a child who has no limbs and is hyper precocious. And she's been affected by her father's exposure to uranium while working in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, uh, which beginning in 1942 uh, was a production site for the Manhattan Project and the bomb. And she also wrote Shadow on the Hearth, which is about a mother and her two children and a community they form with others after they survive atomic bombs falling on New York City. So she's super interesting because in 1968, Merrill left the US for Canada after she went witnessed police violence at the Democratic Convention in Chicago, and she went on to live in Toronto and became involved in anti-Vietnam War activities, as well as transnational movements that were confronting militarism and environmental damage created by war and state violence. So she helped organize and run the Committee to Aid Refugees from Militarism, and then was doing all this work on Japanese environmental and anti-militarist movements. So that's part of the story of climate change and the destruction of the earth kind of coming to science fiction. I think in the 1960s, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring in 1962 really precipitates a lot of writing on this topic. And her uh, book actually begins with a little piece, uh, which is a fable about the poisoning of the environment, which I have analyzed as a kind of science fiction story. Uh, but shortly after that, we see J.G. Ballard's disaster novels, the burning world and the drowned world. And uh, I think Frank Herbert's Dune in 1965 is important. I, for me, it's the most kind of ambitious 1960s novel to deal with ecology and climate. Butler actually often cited it as an influence on her parable novels. But there you have world building on a harsh desert planet and the, suit, the still suits recycling body waste for water, the critique of the ideal of growth, uh, the attempt to extract resources in a colonial context. And <clears throat> Herbert was really influenced by Carson, but also by his conversations with his indigenous friends from the Quileute communities of Washington's Pacific Coast and others from Oregon. And Herbert actually spoke at the very first Earth Day, which was in 1970. So I think that whole history is pretty interesting. With Vietnam, we have more kind of worries about ecological destruction, and we have Merrill and Wilhelm actually writing a petition. Kate Wilhelm, who was one of the co-founders of the Clarion uh, Workshop, they got a petition going against the Vietnam War, and Merrill was especially worried about the ecological disasters that were going to happen, she thought, as a result of it. But they got a lot of people to sign this petition, but they also had a big one that was supporting the war that all kinds of famous science fiction writing, writers uh, signed, so it's always been a struggle. But um, of course, Le Guin's novel, Word for a World is Forest, from that era is anti-Vietnam War, but also very much an early ecological novel. She was talking about the defoliation of the forests and the grasslands and the murder of non-combatants in the name of peace. She said that's only a corollary of that ethic, which permits the defoliation of natural resources for private profit, and the murder of the creatures of the earth in the name of man. Uh, but then in the 80s, we start to get more emerging kind of climate change research making its way into the public eye. And Octavia Butler was saving all of that stuff. We find hundreds of clippings and all kinds of research she did to write Parable of the Sower. She said global warming is a character in Parable of the Sower, which comes out in the early 90s. I also just want to quickly call attention to a couple other uh, things from this time. So Derek Bell's The Space Traders is another thing I want to put on the map here. In 1992, he's a critical race theorist, Derek Bell. He wrote a short story, The Space Traders, uh, that was satirizing the racism and xenophobia of the Reagan era, but also imagining aliens coming down to Earth and offering to solve Earth's problems, including climate change, if the US agrees to send all Black people to an unknown fate on an alien star. So Bell explicitly blames decades of conservative laissez-faire capitalism and the greedy exploitation of Earth's natural resources for all the things you see in the story, like oil slicks and dead birds on the beaches and smog. And so uh, the elderly and sick even have to wear masks while they're outdoors. And you see that crude oil and coal are almost exhausted. So I think that Bell is really trying to get us to think about what that tradition of Black sacrifice. And uh, so in order to continue to enjoy their privileged way of life without having to pay the cost of climate change, 
uh, Bell says the U.S. would not hesitate to require Black people to sacrifice themselves. He says it's happened again and again, and he gives us all kinds of historical precedents. So that one's kind of forgotten, and I think is super important. And then the last one is Leslie Marmon Silko's Almanac of the Dead in 1991. That's a near future novel built up out of elements of her present. But there, because we're seeing all kinds of people of color and indigenous organizing happening in the early 90s, like the first National People of Color Leadership Summit in DC, I see Silco really responding to all of that and coming up with a vision of the future where giving land back to native people and those kinds of struggles are really kind of the key to planetary survival. Fantastic, and uh, lots there for um, many of us to check out. Um, we're sort of coming towards the end of the session, unfortunately, we go on for a lot longer. <laughs> I imagine it will be fantastic to do so. Um, so Annalee, I just wanted to sort of wrap up a bit with um, thinking about dystopia, I guess. And I mean, in your nonfiction book, Scatter, Adapt and Remember, you explore various cataclysmic events in the history of the earth, which includes the sixth mass extinction which we're living through at the moment um, and the possible social and environmental outcomes of, of this period that we're living through has been explored in many speculative novels and dystopias have become uh, hugely popular in recent decades, possibly going through a bit of an oversaturation um, process. Um, so to what degree do you think many dystopian novels, shows and films have become an enabler of what Mark Fisher described as capitalist realism? That's the sort of idea of um, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Um, I guess just want, uh, in, you know, in this closing part, just to get your thoughts on uh, how dystopias can um, sort of foster pessimism and paralysis, but I guess also ways that um, science fiction can challenge pessimism and paralysis. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, dystopias can be quite useful. Um, I always kind of go back to uh, Frederick Jameson's idea that you know, pop culture lures us in because it either offers us a kind of hidden glimpse of utopia or some kind of negative or critical um, uh, intervention. Um, so it, it either provides us with a critique or a glimpse of utopia. Um, so those are kind of the stick and the carrot of social change, right? And I think that it isn't just that it's hard for us to imagine the end of capitalism. Um, I think it's hard for us to imagine social change rather than just burn it all down. Um, burning it all down is easy. Um, the, prob the, the hard thing to do is to imagine generations of slowly or even medium speed shifting um, how our civilizations are built and how we participate in them. So I think that right now we're in a phase where we're about to be seeing a lot more utopian writing. Uh, and I think that's partly because the world itself has become so dystopian. We've, you know, historically, um, say in the 1930s, um, we saw a lot of utopian uh, films and utopian science fiction coming out of that period, I think, again, because we were dealing with similar things like still recovering from a pandemic, um, you know, world wars, um, you know, uh, the sort of colonial struggles that were still white hot at that time. Um, and so I think there's a couple places I would, um, to, 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 kind of, to kind of close us out, a couple of books I would recommend. Um, one is um, Tade Thompson's novel, Rosewater, which is uh, the first in a trilogy. Um, actually, what Shelley was saying was making me think about that um, because he is um, writing about an alien invasion um, that is uh, in Nigeria. And it's kind of an alien invasion, but it's also kind of like the aliens come and they're like, we can help you. We can help you become, um, we can cure injuries. We can heal the environment. Um, you just have to kind of join us in our maybe revolutionary, maybe colonial um, 
uh, invasion here. And the characters are, it's very ambiguous that the main characters are super fascinating and are kind of tempted to join these aliens, but also leery of what it might mean um, and how it might transform the planet. Um, and so that's a kind of, um, I think revisiting of the questions um, that uh, we were just talking about with like, how, how do we, do we sacrifice black people for environmental uh, change or do we sacrifice the poor for environmental change? Um, so he's grappling with those questions. Um, on the utopian end of things on like a much more kind of um, unambiguously utopian end, uh, Becky Chambers uh, has a new uh, series of novellas which begin with um, one that's called a psalm for the wild built. Um, and it's set on, I think it's another planet um, where uh, it's a kind of eco socialist world. It's quite, um, it's kind of like what if Humboldt County were the future? Um, and, you know, everyone is um, permitted to do what they like. And the main character is just very restless uh, and, and kind of uh, becomes a, a bit of a wanderer. And she encounters a robot uh, out in the forest. And long, long ago, robots and humans separated because humans realized they were oppressing the robots. And so they were like, okay, you robots go off and do what you want. And so this is the first sort of human robot meeting in a long time. And so it's just all about kind of um, healing past wounds and like just enjoying nature. <laughs> There's a lot of scenes where they're just like enjoying nature and eating like really healthy food that tastes really good. <laughs> Um, so, and lots of philosophical conversations. Um, and then I think the final um, recommendation, I guess, that I would make is um, Kelly Robeson has a great novella, which is called Gods, Monsters, and the Lucky Peach, uh, which combines uh, an environmental utopian strand with um, time travel. And uh, the reason why the characters use time travel is that they're trying to get baseline readings on the uh, on Earth ecosystems from before the Industrial Revolution. So they're all just the only people using time travel are like policy wonks and nerds, and they have like lots of paperwork. They go back in time. They take environmental samples. They come back, and they're rebuilding the world. Um, it's a post eco apocalypse. Um, and it's very, very hopeful uh, about our ability to change, but also quite clear eyed about the fact that humans keep getting ensnared in bureaucracy, we keep getting ensnared in um, petty fights, nothing's ever going to be perfect, but at least we can try. So um, I think that that's that kind of hard earned, tough utopianism um, is something I see uh, flowering a lot right now in, in science fiction and fantasy. And um, I'm here for it. I love that. Um, I think we need uh, hope as well as reminders of how uh, screwed up things are. Great. Well, I'd like to thank you both for um, taking part in the session today. Uh, encourage people to check out your various websites. And um, there's also been some links in the chat um, to where people can find more of your work. Uh, thanks to City Lights uh, again for organising uh, the symposium and the session today and um, thanks for all the comments in the chat and so forth as well too. Thank you, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks for having us. Hmm.